Hello, my name is Claudia Gordon, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to a reading from Those Who Are Saved by Los Angeles author Alexis Landau. Alexis is a graduate of Vassar College, holds an MFA from Emerson College, and also a PhD in English Literature and Creative Writing from the University of Southern California. Her second novel, Those Who Are Saved, is centered around the exile community of Weimar by the Sea, of which Villa Aurora and the former residents Leon and Martha Feuchtwanger were such integral parts. In fact, both the house and the Feuchtwangers feature rather prominently in the book. Following the reading, Alexis will discuss the genesis of her fictional rendering of that time period and the importance of historical sources with Michaela Ullmann, Exile Studies Librarian and Instruction Coordinator at USC Libraries Department of Special Collections. Michaela holds an MA in Cultural Anthropology and Archaeology from the University of Bonn, as well as an MA in Libraries and Information Sciences from San Jose State University. As a faculty member at USC, she oversees the Feuchtwanger Memorial Library, which is home to Leon Feuchtwanger's invaluable collection of 30,000 books. She also oversees the archive of important papers by German artists and intellectuals who fled Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s and found refuge in Los Angeles. I would like to thank our partners, Penguin Random House and USC Libraries, and I hope that you'll enjoy the program. Vera paced the length of the oriental rug, rubbing her palms against her pleated skirt. But we're foreign nationals, we don't have French citizenship, and the radio said all foreign nationals must report. Yes, but you see, Elsa interrupted, perched on the edge of the cushion settee. The French government has more reason to intern us because we're German and this is a time of war, whereas you are merely Russians, having resided in France for much longer than we have. We're Jewish or beasts, Leon remarked sardonically from the corner. Max said, the Germans have persecuted you, not just for being Jewish, but Leon, you publicly denounced Hitler in, in your many articles and books. You're the enemy of the state number one. Where was that printed again? He poured more whiskey into Leon's glass. Well, the point is the French government will directly realize that you're an enemy of Germany and a lover of France. They won't intern you. Or, Leon offered, shifting in the deep leather chair, the French government will proceed against us only to give the public the impression that France is actually doing something to repel the Germans. Vera noticed his sweat sprinkling the back of Leon's pale blue dress shirt despite his cool demeanor. Even if that were the case, Max interjected, pouring himself another thimble of whiskey, there's one thing we can be sure of. He paused for dramatic effect, relishing how they waited for him to inject some reason into this tangled night. As we have all experienced countless times, the utter ineffective workings of the French bureau bureaucracy will ensure that it will take ages for the paperwork to arrive here in Sanary to intern us. By then we'll be gone. Elsa and Leon heartily agreed, placated by Max's logic. They would remain in this summery cocoon a little longer. And Max, smoothing down the front of his shirt with panther-like calm, was satisfied with himself for saving the evening, as he would later say in bed, expecting praise from Vera when all she felt was cold dread. After the initial shock of the news that night, the tone turned less manic, and during the momentary lulls when the conversation drifted elsewhere, the evening nearly recaptured the languor they had enjoyed on other summer nights. But even as they entertained the possibilities and examined the various angles of their predicament, Vera felt her fixed place in the world beginning to unhinge and loosen. Every noise grated, every gesture appeared imbued with portentous meaning. The occasional bird call trilling in the night made her jump, and the clatter of dishes cleared from the table in the next room sounded hostile. Lucy's barreling run down the hallway attempting to escape the bath sent a sharp pang through Vera as though all had turned irretrievably dark, even as Elsa's heady perfume with hints of benzoin reminded her of other times when they would sit idly after dinner, smoking and drinking and lamenting some insignificant comical aspect of their lives. The following morning, while Vera sat at the breakfast table nursing a coffee, her head pounding from too much whiskey, the cook, Sabine, appeared before her with a stricken face. She announced with an air of self-importance, that she had read a notice posted in the town hall. All persons of foreign birth living in the VAR department 
in the Provence Alps Côte d'Azur region who had not yet reached the age of 56 must report to the GERS internment camp in southwestern France, effective immediately. Max, listening from the doorway, barefoot in silk pajamas, asked casually as if to reassure Sabine that this was all an overreaction. Surely there's been some mistake. Two days ago, the wireless specified that only those living in Paris must report for internment. Well, Alexis, thank you so much for being here at Villa Aurora today. Um, and I look forward to talking with you about your book. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's amazing to be here in the place where so much of the book takes place and all this history. So thank you. My pleasure. So in your own words, what is those who are saved about, just briefly, for those who haven't read it yet? It is, um, it is in essence about a mother who is searching for her lost daughter during and after World War II, um, spanning from 1940 to 1945 and set in France and Los Angeles. Um, and it's told from three points of view. So we have Vera's point of view, who um, is one of the war emigres who comes here with her husband and they um, settle in Los Angeles um, near this very place. <laughs> um, and then it is also told from their daughter's point of view, Lucy, who is um, hiding in a convent. Um, and it starts when she's four years old, so it's a more of a child-like point of view. And then the third point of view includes um, Sasha, who is also an immigrant, but very different in the sense that he um, came over to the U.S. in the late 20s and grew up on the Lower East Side and has these ambitions to become a writer-director. So he is also here in Los Angeles. So that's essentially what it's about. And you grew up in Los Angeles. Have you always been aware of this history of the German-speaking exiles and intellectuals who ended up here? And, and what did, what did, um, why did you write about them? Why did you want to write about them? Um, well, I, growing up, was not aware of that history, even though I did grow up, you know, about 10 minutes from here, basically. And my best friend growing up lived on Adelaide, which was right near Mayberry Road, where Salka Vertel um, lived and so many of the other exiles. But I didn't know anything about it. And actually, growing up, I felt I had this, you know, idea of L.A. that there was no real culture here, there was no there there, all those cliches about LA that I think do have a grain of truth, but it's not the whole story. So I, um, I had to leave to feel like a real person. <laughs> um, and then when I came back is when I actually started uh, digging in much more into the history. And while I was at USC um, for my graduate degree was when I really started to know about it because of the wonderful library, the Exile Studies Library and the Marta Feutwanger Memorial Library. So there were so many amazing sources. And then once that, you know, I found that out, it was just an explosion of archives and treasures and information that I just, the more I read, the more fascinated I became. Yeah, you can tell. I mean, many of the, the, the people in the book, the characters in the book, as well as the places like Sanari Sumer and Villa Aurora, they are many of them are based on true true people and, and true places. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your your research process? You just mentioned you came to to USC to the Feuchtwanger Memorial Library. Where else did you go, or what else did you do to dig out all these like elements? Yeah, well, definitely the USC Library. I must have checked out fifty books not from the Memorial Library, but from the, nor the normal, the Doheny Library. Um, and some of those I still have, and I keep renewing them. Um, but then also just memoirs or oral histories became really important, like Salpa Vertel's memoir, The Kindness of Strangers, and uh, Marta, who in the book, her name is Elsa, but there, you, if you know about that history, you'll be able to see the correlation. Um, Marta Feutwanger, her oral history, was amazing as well that I read in the the memorial or in the special collections, um, and then coming here to Villa Aurora as well was 
really illuminating because I just, everything is restored just as it was for the most part. Um, so the rug, the couch. So you get a sense of what it was really like instead of having to imagine it so much. Um, and then there are lots of photographs from that time that again, through USC Digital Library, you can access, which were really helpful because even the fashion, I became pretty obsessed with Marta's fashion. <laughs> she would wear these amazing jumpsuits and it, she looks so modern. Um, and so it just really gave the flavor to the book. And then each character in a way, I guess you could say like Vera and Max, for me represented the world of the exiles because they, in my fictional universe, they join that you know, world. And so they opened up that trove of research, but each character had its own research, you know, pile. So um, Lucy, I had to do a lot of research in terms of children who were lost or hidden. And there are memoirs of that too. And actually um, I was in Holland with my husband's family because he's from there a few years ago and met a woman who had told me about uh, a girl that they hid in their farm and she called her my hiding sister. And that idea of how close those two girls became and then after the war, war, her hiding sister returned to her parents and luckily her parents survived. But this idea of that kind of relationship really inspired um, Lucy's relationship with her friend Camille in the convent. Um, so just, hearing stories and reading about that really helped. And the sources are all in the back of the book. So if anyone wants to read more and then, but, and then Sasha's character too was a whole other uh, piece of research. I did a lot of research on the golden age of Hollywood and um, you know, what is the inside of Louis B. Mayer's office? What did it look like? You know, how the studio system worked. It was a lot and it could have, it could have swallowed me up. I mean, it, that's always the problem with research is when do you stop and when do you feel like you have enough? Um, so I just also got really swept up into that world and had to, you know, not, <laughs> that could have been its own separate book. So I think that all of those things combined along with um, photographs, even of the war and D-Day or lesser known um, aspects of the war when they're fighting in Sicily. Robert Kappa is one of my favorite photographers and he has amazing um, collections of his time fighting and taking you know, photographs during that time. So that was also really helpful. Yeah, you can tell that the, the book is fantastically researched and all the different story elements, like, like you said, like each one was probably a whole research project just to like build a character. And I, I really appreciated that when I read the, the book. Um, for those familiar with them, it's easy to recognize the characters of Elsa and Leon Freudenberger, that they are representing Martha and Leon Feuchtwanger. And um, can, you, can you tell us, I mean, you already mentioned that you were impressed with the house, but can you tell us what inspired you to give them such a prominent role in the book? Yeah, um, I mean, for one, they, as a couple, are very interesting to me, and they had a really modern contemporary relationship, which definitely, you know, <laughs> piqued my interest. <laughs> and I, they are, they were also very vibrant and um, sprung to life when I read about them. Um, they, I felt like they had so much life in them. And the fact that they, I mean, you can, you can comment more on this than I can but it seemed as if on the surface they survived so well and they adapted and they were very tough in that sense. And, um, and, and on one hand though, in part, it's because I think Leon was able to keep writing and publishing and that he was so successful. So that helped, of course, the financial element, but at the same time, their attitude was very can do and, you know, let's roll up our sleeves and make this work and Marta, renovated this whole house. And I remember reading about, which I didn't even really barely get to put into my book, but that it was sort of in shambles and she just, it was. <laughs> you know, rolled up her sleeves literally and worked on it herself with someone who helped her. And she just had this spirit, this indomitable spirit of, she was tough and she did these things on her own. 
and she found all the furniture and she would hike in the mountains and, um, and also make everything in a way possible for Leon to write. So sometimes I wonder uh, what did she want to do more or was that enough for her? I mean, it's an interesting question and I don't, I don't know the, the answer to that. So yeah. I don't know if you well, That could know. be another novel. Yes, I know. <laughs> She's in it and yeah, it, it's, it's a whole, that was in part what is so fascinating about researching, but also, again, like the fine balance of remembering, like, okay, these, she's the best friend, but let's not get too carried away with that, so. Yeah. Elsa and Leon found a Spanish villa nestled in the hills of the Pacific Palisades, overlooking the sea, and they tried to convince Vera and Max to live up there, too. But with no schools, hospitals, or grocery stores nearby, such a place would be unsuitable for Lucy once they brought her here. Vera explained this in Michal's kitchen where they were temporarily staying while looking for a house to rent. It was Sunday. Max prepared miniature mustard cheese sandwiches even though he muttered the cheese tasted like wax paper before skewering each one with a toothpick, the ends of which were wrapped in blue-green cellophane reminding Vera of a children's party. And with the petrol rations, how will you get anywhere, Vera wondered. The house is so far away from everything. Oh, I won't have to drive much, Elsa said with a wry smile. I walk down to the water, there's a little grocery there, and I hike my way back up. Leon threw up his hands in mock surrender. All the windows are broken, the backyard is entirely overgrown, and the basement is knee-deep in mice and lizards, but we bought it for $9,000. Elsa turned to Vera and whispered, he just sold his latest book to Martin Seckler in London, so he's feeling flush. The last one in the Josephus trilogy? No, the Lautensack brothers. Of course, Vera thought. He's working on two manuscripts simultaneously, managing to sell one that she didn't even know he was writing, causing her to feel oddly betrayed, as if they had purposefully kept it secret until they could flash around the news of the sale with artificial nonchalance. There's not a scrap of furniture. We'll have to sleep in the backyard until the house is habitable, Leon added swiping one of those cheese sandwiches off the platter and popping it into his mouth, in sleeping bags. A Persian prince lives in one of the neighboring villas, Elsa said. At least that's what the agent said. It can't be entirely wild up there. The landscape reminds me of Tuscany, Leon rejoined, chewing pensively on the sandwich. That's why we took it so quickly. And then he reminisced about their sojourn throughout Italy when they were young and first married, they backpacked and he wrote his manuscripts while she prepared the food and tent, arranging all the details so he could focus on his work. Clearly, nothing has changed, Elsa said, giving him a peck on the cheek before pouring coffee into each porcelain cup. After a week of searching, Max and Vera found a house to rent on Adelaide Drive in Santa Monica Canyon, a quaint English-style cottage with avocado trees and azaleas in the garden and rooms with slanted ceilings and views of the sea, for only $80 a month. But there were still so many practicalities to arrange. Everyone said they would need a car, but Vera had no idea how to procure one. They would also need a housekeeper once Max secured a contract at a studio. How else will you entertain, Salka Vertel asked as she strode through the newly painted rooms, rubbing her arms up and down as though the recently vacated house, without even a rug to cover the hardwood floors or a throw pillow to brighten the faded couch, made her shiver. She had moved here from Vienna with her husband, a playwright, before the war, and assumed the queenly position of connecting those who needed help with those who could dispense it. She was the epicenter of emigre life in Los Angeles, and her house on Mayberry Road, a two-minute stroll from Vera and Max's, was brimming with recent arrivals from Europe, many of whom were desperate for work. Everyone knew Salka, and knowing her brought you closer to knowing everyone else. From picture people such as Garbo and Chaplin, to famous musicians such as Stravinsky and Korngold, along with a host of aspiring artists whom she nurtured and included in her Sunday salons. I know a very nice Dutch woman, Salka announced, glancing up into the corners of the living room, which glistened with spider webs, who used to be a pediatrician in Rotterdam, Hilda Assendorp. She's looking for housework. The two of you will get on well. So Alexis, the novel also centers around motherhood. Vera and Lucy, they are mother and daughter. Why, why was this important to you? Um, well, I think the, the novel is very much, you're right, about motherhood and it's about the bright torture of it, 
um, you know, the rage, the guilt, the, um, the grief, and all of those emotions mixed together. And I think that um, when I was writing Vera, you know, just because of the plot and the way it, it unfolded, it was that she did have a daughter that she left behind. And that was for me a jumping off point to explore all of those emotions that I think are universal to a certain extent and, and timeless um, in terms of the experience of motherhood. And the stakes, of course, are greatly raised in the situation of war and making those certain choices. But I think even you know, with my own experience, um, having two children, who actually my daughter was four years old also when I started writing the book. So kind <laughs> of seeing the progression of that relationship, um, I definitely wanted to experience and express some of those very, you know, torrential emotions in the character of Vera. So I think um, the separation, the distance definitely, you know, adds to it. But at the same time, it could even be more psychological or more subtle in terms of the um, conflicts that parents have sometimes with children or especially mothers and daughters, um, where you could even be in the same room but feel this great um, distance or sense of not connecting or not being able to connect. So I think um, that it became much more about a mother and a daughter than I thought it was going to be in the beginning. Um, and I didn't have Lucy's point of view included either in the sort of, I think, first draft, or maybe it was halfway through the draft that I realized that I really wanted to capture her point of view as well. Um, but just in terms of what, it was more after I finished the book, I thought it was gonna be much more focused on Vera and Sasha and their um, affair. But it actually, the love affair was actually between um, Vera and Lucy. Um, in the sense of its intensity, it, it became the beating heart of the novel. And oddly, I also, it's so strange what you notice after something is done, even though you've been working on it for years. I also realized that in a way, the structure of the novel and even in terms of her search and all of these things um, is reflective of the Demeter Persephone myth, which is that Demeter you know, loses her daughter Persephone, who, you know, is taken to the underworld by Hades. And then she is returned to her mother, but always with an exception. And so, and it's this pain that Demeter feels. She stops all life on earth. You know, she, she suffers, she grieves, she rages. She really can't live until she finds her daughter. And that, I realized, was Vera, you know, was completely encapsulated in Vera. And Yes, when I don't want to give too much away, but this idea of going back to the title, like those who are saved, yes, you can get something back, but so much is lost in the process. It's, it's, it's not you know, exclusive. So it's, there, there's always pain even in the, in the reunion. You know, so. Yeah, and you can really feel this. I mean, it's, it's also interesting the different reactions or the different ways of how Vera and Max deal with the, the loss or the separation from, from Lucy. So I, I just really felt, although I'm not a mother, I could really feel what a mother would feel um, when she was separated from her daughter. Yeah, and I don't think you have to necessarily be a mother or have children because also we were all once children and you know felt maybe abandoned in different ways or lost and then found, or, you know, all these different ways that that plays out. Um, and yes, I do. I did want to also explore how, not to make things overly gendered, but how men and women often do experience grief very differently and loss of a child very differently. Um, and especially that in that time period, like men were supposed to be more stoic, you could say, or more closed off from their emotions. You know, he also had work to disappear into, which was really helpful. And Vera couldn't you know, really work. Um, I mean, she does end up getting a job, but not in the creative sense that really fulfills her. So she's just not, she's not able to move on in the same way that he is. As so many refugees of uh, Nazi occupied Europe, Vera and Max live through the separation from family members while trying to stay alive themselves. Um, probably the hardest decision uh, for them was to leave their daughter, Lucy. 
um, with a friend when they had to enter the internment camp in Gore and then later on eventually having to leave for the United States. Um, in your author's note, you also mentioned the writer Irene Nemirovsky and her novel Sud Francaise. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the impact of her work on you. Yes, um, she is definitely a very big inspiration for Vera. Um, she, she's a Russian Jewish writer who escaped the revolution with her parents in 1917 and they moved to Paris. And so she grew up in Paris, similar to Vera feeling both that she belonged and she didn't belong. Um, but then ultimately she became very assimilated in French culture. She wrote novels, she was celebrated, and you know her husband was, uh, they lived together in Paris and felt very settled and couldn't even imagine that they would have to leave another country again. Um, and so in terms of like Vera's state of mind, um, when all of that happens, is very much drawn on my research of Nemirovsky. And I did write my PhD uh, thesis on her. So I felt really familiar with her sort of um, viewpoint on herself and her status and all of these things that in a way you could say blinded her from leaving in time um, to get out. And so in a way the book, this book is a wish fulfillment as if imagining what if she had escaped in time and um, come to Los Angeles and you know became part of this community of exiles as opposed to not and meeting the terrible fate that so many other um, Jews and artists did who didn't leave in time. And it always really um, makes me sort of upset when people say like, oh, well, why, why didn't she leave? Or, you know, why didn't they get out in time? And it, it's so much more complicated than that. Like, you know, even the Feuzwangers, they, the situations were so different in each country. So in Germany, of course, they knew that they had to leave and they couldn't come back. They were already, he was on a US tour during um, the time that he became like a most wanted man. Um, and so that obviously was clear. He couldn't go back to Germany. And even they went to France thinking this is a safe place to go. Yeah. Um, and they waited long to leave as well. Yeah, they almost they all, waited too long. Right. Yeah. And so there's this, there's this idea somehow that people were supposed to have, uh, you know, some prophetic vision of what awaited them. But again, they couldn't imagine something as terrible and awful as what happened. It, it's unimaginable. It never happened before in history. You know, and there were lots of Jews who said, oh, this will pass, um, you know, public opinion changes and we'll be fine. Or even the idea of just going to an internment camp is different from a concentration camp. It was more of like a holding place. Um, and it was still controlled by the French. So again, it was like, oh, we'll get out in two weeks. We'll figure this out. And of course, that isn't what happened for many others. Um, and so I think just those nuances are sometimes like lost in history because we are looking back at it, exactly. right? Yeah, um, we know we know what happened, but they didn't. Right, at the time. and there it's a lot harder to to leave um, than I think. Also, I mean, especially if you don't think, you know, that if you don't leave, you're going to die for sure. You know, like there was there were a family, there were grandparents, there were children. It, it just it wasn't so easy. So I think that is something that. I hope readers take away from this as well. Um, another storyline in your novel is the one of Sasha, who later becomes more significant um, uh, to the other protagonists. Can you tell us a little bit more about who he is and why you decided to include him? Yeah, um, he is a, a he's younger um, than Vera, but not much younger, and he is of an entirely different kind of immigrant um, than she is. So in one way, that was one reason why I wanted to include him. Um, he came over also from Russia. He's, you know, they're both from Russia, but in, again, such different ways. Um, he comes over from Russia with his mother in, I think it's 1927. They settle on the Lower East Side. He grows up there and he be feels so much more American than, you know, Vera does who comes later. And he really um, 
is part of the you know, greatest generation in terms of his mindset. He's very optimistic. He doesn't want to think about the past. He wants to look forward. Like Eleanor Roosevelt always said, look forward, not back, you know, and he really embraces that. And in some ways, you know, you could argue he, he's overcompensating because there's something about his past that he doesn't want to um, contend with. But he then joins up and, you know, joins up to fight. And he's all about this so forward momentum and energy and creativity. He comes back after the war. He survives and um, is very ambitious and starts making his career here in Hollywood. And so in some ways, he's like a direct contrast to Vera in a lot of ways, who is stuck in the past and cannot write, you know, and is blocked creatively and is filled with so much grief. And the past for her is just right there in front of her. Like she can't see far, you know, even the next day, really. And so in a way, that's how their relationship develops. Like they have these two wounds that are they might seem completely opposite on the surface, but they dovetail. So his wound is that he can't look back and her wound is she can't look forward. And so they help each other in the end. At first, Sasha declined. He had to prep for next week. They were behind schedule and still had a few more days of shooting left, including some big scenes. But when her new boyfriend, Otto Beckmann, the German artist, picked Hetty up, he insisted that Sasha join them and Sasha gave in to his jovial persuasions Sasha drove with the windows down, the sinking blue sky falling over the hills and the highway. The ocean was restless, waves towering to a full, foamy height before crashing against the shore. Up ahead, Otto's bullet of a car veered over the yellow line and then back again, Heidi's silk scarf flickering in the wind and emerald green. Sasha followed Otto now, unsure where this house was. The sharp turn Onto sunset was a surprise, and then another quick one folded him into the hills, shaded by brush, sage, and eucalyptus trees. Otto slowed on the dirt road that zigzagged upward, cutting into the mountain before he turned onto a shaded street. From here, Sasha made out parts of a Spanish villa, but the curved whitewashed walls and hedges hid most of it. Behind the house, the Santa Monica Bay flashed with the illuminated pier its steel roller coasters set against the blurry horizon. Otto and Hetty walked toward him, speculating about who would be here. It was someone's birthday, a German writer Sasha didn't know. He heard a piano thundering over the din of dinner party talk. They made their way down the terracotta steps into an open air patio, which had a lily pond in its center. Otto called out, sorry we're late Elsa, but we brought a little treat for you, an American director, Sasha Rabinovich. The woman, Elsa, smiled up at him from the patio, the silk folds of her peridot kimono hanging down from her outstretched arm. Please come inside. Sasha sensed her sturdy womanliness, her leonine grace, and liked her immediately. She slid her arm through his and led him into the house. Two tortoises traipsed ahead, leaving a wet trail along the terracotta stones. In the entryway, the scent of roasted meat hit him and his mouth watered. It's delicious, my duck, she said, as if reading his mind. In the same breath, she directed a housemaid to refill champagne glasses, gesturing toward the living room, where a swirl of men in cardigans and monocles conversed in a cacophony of German, French, English, and Russian. They reminded Sasha of Fritz Lang, who he met a few months ago at a party. Lang had just finished directing The Woman in the Window, and he wondered if Lang might even be here. Stepping back for a moment, he marveled at the beauty of the place. The whitewashed walls emanated a serene coolness and views of the sea filled every window. While eucalyptus trees shaded the backyard, the leaves shimmering in the setting sun. Leather bound novels lined the bookcases and a gleaming black steinway stood in the corner where a man sat studying some sheet music. An unbridled vibrancy pulsed through the room as if the air were made of ideas, poetic, political, sharply satiric. Sasha caught bits and pieces of conversations that rose up from the din, the incurable problem of music and films, if anyone would dare to return to Europe after the war, and was Germany forever ruined, its great cultural history swallowed up by the Nazi horror. His mother had always wanted him to stand in such a room, 
and she had believed college was the way inside of it, and maybe it was for some people, but he had done it his way. He recalled their recent phone conversation when he told her he was finally directing his own picture, and yes, there was even a love story baked into it. She paused before congratulating him, but it was in her suspension of breath, the warm moment gathering around them, when he finally felt the rush of her approval. Hetty took his arm, drawing him farther into the living room. She smiled playfully. It's nice, isn't it? Our little European colony on the Pacific, almost like home. So Max and Vera, they have very different um, feelings towards returning to Europe after the war and this decision to return or not to return. And then also the reproach that the exiles survived living in paradise was experienced by many of the exiles. Um, what was your inspiration for including these particular struggles in your novel? Well, it really adds to the nuance of the whole world um, and how even as like a one group, you might think of them as the same, but so many of the exiles, they were so different. They had different plights. They had different dreams, different experiences in paradise. So, you know, like, for example, Thomas Mann seemed like pretty happy here. He had an amazing house. <laughs> he would just be writing. He had his family here. So for him, going back um, to Germany was less obvious, maybe, as a decision. But I have more to say about that in a minute. But, you know, his brother um, Heinrich was not doing very well. So even within the same family, you could have such different um, outcomes. And he, he did want to go back to Germany very much. Um, and he did um, to, you know, teach and to write. And that's where he felt at home. And he never really felt at home here. So I wanted to show that with the difference between Vera and Max and how for him, for Max, he was really succeeding here. He had finally, you know, he'd gotten a really great contract composing for MGM. And he didn't want to go back to, you know, France. And he said, there's nothing for us there anymore. And that is true for especially um, the Jewish exiles. And Vera, you know, of course, she's afraid to go back and she knows that he might be right about so many of the fears of what they will encounter if they did actually go back. But of course she has to, because that's where her daughter is um, or where she thinks she is. So it's, for her, it's not even a choice. Um, and yeah, and I'm also really interested in and again, this, this wasn't included because <laughs> then it's, maybe it will be in the third book. Um, but in terms of how also another reason why some of the exiles did return was that it almost seemed overnight after World War II ended, you know, they were suddenly then suspicious or under suspicion yeah. of being communist yeah, and, exactly. you know, like blacklisted. The McCarthy era. Yeah, and with the Red Scare. And so they they had thought that they're here, you know, for freedom and it was a safe haven and it was, and then suddenly it changed on them again. And they had to, some of them left for the, that reason. Yeah. I think ultimately Thomas Mann yeah. also was really disgusted by how the pendulum swung, swung so yeah. rapidly back in the other direction, um, which is another thing for me that I'm really interested in how history shifts like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I mean, some like like Thomas Mann left, like you said, disgusted by the the, the Red Scare, and then others like Hans Eisler were forced out or or Bertolt Brecht. Um, they even had to like testify. Um, the House of America. Yeah, yeah, and Salka Vertel too. Or she had a hard time. It was like getting her. I think she was on. Or? Yeah, and she was on the end, uh, the Hollywood anti. Um, I mean, she was she was like in different organizations. Um, the anti anti Nazi league and things like that, and that got her into right. A, yeah, the minute it became um, interpreted as something else. Yeah, Vera studied the overgrown grass and thought of Max and Sasha meeting each other made her cringe. While at the same time, another part of her wondered what it would be like. She already knew what Max would say. Sasha came off as brash, too American, a roguish filmmaker with a New York accent from a poor family from some shtetl. What could they possibly have in common? Everything and nothing, Vera thought. Max leaned forward, and he's a war hero? Yes, Vera said, noticing that the whites of his eyes looked milkier. But I'm leaving for Paris tomorrow. Is he accompanying you? No. The scent of Hildy's spiced honey cake 
wafted through the open kitchen window, and the sound of a faucet running and then turning off sounded oddly reassuring, as though the ordinary hum of domesticity could muffle all this unpleasantness. The screen door banged shut as Hildy emerged with the, from the house, carrying out the honey cake. Vera's mouth watered. She had forgotten to eat this morning, having drunk too much coffee, and now her legs felt unsteady. You always knew that I would go back the minute the war ended, and now it's over, so I'm... She stopped, seeing Max's eyes flash. He stood up, gesturing with disgust. You think I don't love her as much as you do? Is that it, that I don't mourn her? She tried to swallow. Hilda stood a few feet away, holding the cake. You cling to this fantasy that she's still alive as though you're the one who loves her so that you can be the forever suffering one while I'm the happy opportunist glibly living here in paradise. Vera's cheeks burned, shamed by his contempt for her, as if he had kept it hidden all these years, but now brandished it about, blinding her with it. She couldn't look at his face. It was too startling. His features contorted, rendering him unrecognizable. As someone who works in the field of exile studies, I know that the stories, the fates, the contributions of female exiles um, are well under-recognized. Um, we usually hear about the men, like you said, Thomas Mann, Leon Feuchtwanger, Hans Eisler, um, even Heinrich Mann, although he wasn't so successful here in the United States. But um, just for like the, the last few years or so, we start hearing a few of the stories of, of female exiles and how they did or what their challenges and also their contributions were. Um, although there are many uh, male protagonists in your book, the main protagonists are female, and I wonder, was this, um, what were the reasons behind this? What, was this a, an obvious choice for you to make, or what? Um, yes, I mean, as I was re researching the exiles, definitely the men loom large <laughs> and kind of overshadow a lot of the women and their wives, and so in part it was, I wanted to give some of those female characters a voice or figures, you know, in, in one way or another. And I was really impressed and interested in Salka Vertel, who was in some ways very much the social epicenter. Or sort of, it felt like she was like, I don't know if she was competing with the Foytwangers, but <laughs> yeah. I felt like they had these different camps um, where she would make her, you know, chocolate tart and everyone loved it and, um, you know, host. And she also was on all these committees and, and she was a, a very, you know, prolific screenwriter and worked with Greta Garbo, I think. Um, so that was, again, I wanted to bring her to life and bring, you know, even though Vera wasn't able to work, just have a female perspective on the experience of exile, um, as opposed to the men who, of course, they just had their own view of it. And that also is very rich. But again, it's there's less there's less known about the female, you know, exiles. And um, the other thing that I also found really fascinating in my research that I just got to touch on, but again, I, it could be a whole other book, was just how, and again, maybe you can comment on this too, but it seemed like there was this general trend where um, a lot of the emigres, they came here and the women, let's say they had been doctors or, you know, musicians or something very accomplished in Europe, and they, they really couldn't find that kind of work here. It was much harder. So they ended up taking menial jobs that were way below what their education level was, what they had done in the past, to help their husbands mm -hmm. work in what they wanted to do, right. you know, to write, <laughs> stay-at-home writing, or get a job composing. And that really, again, I thought, that's not fair. But it also spoke to this kind of female spirit of, let I have to adapt. We need to survive. We need food on the table. I'll be a nanny, even though I used to be an endocrinologist or something like that. So, again, it touched on this idea of former identities and um, you know careers lost, countries lost, and how you deal with that and the difference between the male and female exiles and some of the men because their careers had also been uprooted and they had to totally reinvent themselves in some cases they really struggled with it much more than some of the female exiles. So, Yeah, I found that, that interesting. I also think like sometimes maybe the, 
the women were, yeah, for them it was easier to adapt um, to the new circumstances and while, yeah, may, maybe the men struggled a little bit more or were set in their ways more and right. like, you know, people like Martha Feuchtwanger, they always like, they, they arrived in a new country and they just made it work. And same with, you know, Salka Fertel, she was an actress, but I, she also realized she was probably too old for Hollywood. So she found right. a, a, another or career. the accent might have gotten in the way. Or, e exactly, yeah. exactly. And they also like created these salons to help others, which is... Right, um, yeah. Um, I, was, I was wondering if you can tell us anything about your next project, if you're already thinking about another novel, what, what's next? Um, yes, I mean, I have just finished a draft of my next book, which is very different. It's contemporary, but it has roots in the ancient Greco-Roman mystery cults. Mm. <laughs> so I've definitely <laughs> gone in a different direction. Um, but it, yeah, it's been really nice in some ways to write in a contemporary voice, um, but still has so much history in it. So weirdly, the history keeps drawing me back, even mm. if I think I'm writing something <laughs> contemporary. And then in terms of this book, I do actually see that there will be a third one. Um, and so I've, I've started to research that. And I think it seems like the next generation of whoever these children, you know, children of, for example, you know, Vera and Sasha or whatever, would be Vietnam. It might, you know, be during that sort of late 60s, really tumultuous time. But it would also touch on um, what we were just talking about, how... A lot of the exiles, you know, felt embraced and then suddenly rejected by the U.S. Went during McCarthyism. So that sort of haunting a lot of the, the characters by that point in time. So, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But I need I'll, to do a lot more research. <laughs> <laughs> but very exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, speaking with me uh, about your book. And I highly recommend reading <laughs> Those Who Are Thanks Safe. I really, truly me. enjoyed reading it. Yeah. And, thank you so yeah. much. This has been amazing. Thank you. <laughs>